Hi everyone, I'm continuing my series of videos about the data trove associated with WJE's forensic evaluation report with key items for the Westbound Washington Bridge. As we know, the forensic report was initially posted, uh, excerpts of it was posted by what's going on in Rhode Island. And then the Rhode Island Attorney General posted the full report on his website on September 26, 2025. I'm recording this video on October 16th, 2025. And I've done previous videos where I found excerpts of the metallurgical report. As I've previously covered, I don't understand why the metallurgical report on what happened with the post-tension rods whose failure led to the closure of the Washington Bridge back in December of 2023. I couldn't understand why it was not included even as an appendix to the forensic evaluation report. Well, now I found the full report in this trove of data. Now I'm going to go through it page by page today and talk about the key takeaways. And I'm going to hit the highlights here. I'm going to leave each page up long enough so that you can hit pause if you'd like and read the page in its entirety. So we can see this is the February 19, 2024 report, which was referenced as a footnote on page 14 of the forensic report that, as I mentioned, has already been released by the Attorney General's office. And this report was a detailed evaluation of these post-tension bars that were sampled from the bridge in early January in 2024. So this is page one. On to page two, you can see the chemical analysis on the fracture face, the broken portion of the rods. You see the presence of chlorine, a little bit uh, trace amounts of bromine, which is indicative of salt spray from ocean water. Page three, talking about some mechanical properties of this material that was sampled. Tensile strength of around 160 kips per square inch. A kip is a thousand pounds, for those of you who may not be familiar with that. The yield strength is around 140 KSI. All right, so let's get into the discussion here a little bit. This is the key item, the key takeaway that I want to address. Now, I'm just going to read it in its entirety, this, this paragraph. Based on rust layer thickness on the fracture faces, it is highly likely that the fractures occurred prior to the most recent bridge inspection six months ago. In the reduced sections where fracture occurred, the absence of observable plastic flow in the perlitic steel microstructure suggests that the loss of section was primarily due to corrosion rather than pre-fracture tensile necking. Well, basically, the bars rusted extensively. Sodium and calcium, chlorine, and bromine detected in the corrosion products suggest the presence of sodium and calcium chloride salts with bromide impurities commonly used in roadway de-icing. However, the strength of the bromine peaks in the EDS spectra indicate that the primary source of the salt deposited may have been sea spray since the ratio of bromide ion to chloride ions is more than an order of magnitude higher in seawater than in solutions of de-icing salts. In the present case, it would be reasonable to conclude that both sea spray and de-icing salts were involved. More importantly, salt-bearing moisture from any source well known to accelerate the aqueous corrosion of steel. So if you have salt, and it's mostly road salts here, a little bit of sea spray, they think, if that's on the surface of the steel, that attracts water. And when you bring water into contact with steel, it's going to accelerate the corrosion more so than if there were no salts present. I mean, most of you know that already, particularly if you drive vehicles in the winter where the roads and bridges are salted. But again, going to that initial sentence in that paragraph, why it's important that they're saying the rod was broken for a period longer than six months, the rod breakage was discovered in December 2023. The previous inspection was done in July of 2023. And that's when the bridge was closed. Director Alviti with RIDOT came out and said, hey, the rod broke between July 2023 and December 2023 without offering any evidence. In um, July, the inspection was made. And though the pins that are in question here, the, the anchor uh, rods that are in question here, were in adequate serviceable shape. Uh, once in a while, an extraordinary event will happen, as we, as we, as our engineers are telling us happened in this case. 
some kind of outside force that was extraordinary over and above the normal use of everyday use of the bridge happened between July and now. Um, we, we certainly will be having a look at the forensic analysis of hopefully at least providing a bucket of potential explanations of what could have caused that failure between July and now. Now let's look at the draft version of this. This was February 15, 2024. Let's look at that same paragraph and there's some interesting comments in the margins. So let's go back to that first portion of that paragraph, talking about the timing of the breakage of the rods. Given the roughly linear growth rate of rust over time, based on rust layer thickness, it would be reasonable to conclude that the rust on the fracture faces had formed in approximately half the amount of time as the rust on the external surfaces. It is therefore highly likely that the fractures occurred prior to the most recent bridge inspection six months ago, perhaps even prior to the last several inspections. And the comments in the margin basically say, hey, that part where you say perhaps even prior to the last several inspections, you might wanna think about taking that out. And as we know, in the final version of this report, the February 19th, 2024 version, that reference to the rod breaking several inspection cycles before it was discovered was deleted. So at least in the final version of the metallurgical report, they clearly state that the rod was broken before the most recent inspection in July of 2023. And as, again, as I mentioned, that metallurgical report was not included as an appendix to the forensic evaluation report and instead is just listed as a footnote. And let's go to the portion of this report that references the timing of the anchor rods breaking. The two fracture rods were discovered during December, 2023. The sequence of link slab closures is illustrated in the timeline of figure 37. Specifically closures for span six adjacent to pier six occurred in September, 2022, February, 2023, and July, 2023. Likewise, span seven closures adjacent to pier seven occurred in September, 2022, February, 2023, and June, 2023. The exact time of the fractures cannot be determined, but they were not observed during the July, 2023 routine inspection. WJE's forensic evaluation noted that the thickness of corrosion product on the fractured surfaces suggests the fractures had not occurred very close to the time of discovery. However, it is likely fracture occurred within the time frame that the link slabs were placed. So to me, that's kind of a downplayed and rather confusing way to essentially not clearly state how long you thought the rods had been broken. But if you pick it apart, they basically say it's broken before the most recent inspection, but likely after work was done in September 2022 all the way through July of 2023, but they don't state the basis for that conclusion. And I'm not going to go over it again in this video here, but I've talked in prior videos about how there's other evidence, NSAR data, other information that indicates that these rods were likely broken for many years. All right, just for the sake of completeness, I'm gonna go through the other pages here. You can pause this and look at it at your leisure. Page five, this is page six. They're just uh, taking photographs of these sections of anchor rods next to a ruler for scale. You can see these fracture surfaces. This is page seven. These are scanning electron microscope images. This is page eight. It says here, metallurgic montage of unetched diametral section through the fracture face and bisecting the fracture origin. Well, I don't know what I'm looking at here. That's page nine. Some magnification of some cracks near the fracture face. It's page 10, another metallurgical montage. I can't read it. I had to go through these. These were TIFF files in this data trove. So they weren't searchable. And I had to put them into a PDF and other things. And so there's a little bit of image degradation. So my eyesight as I've gotten older isn't the greatest. I can't quite read that out there. Another image of, I don't know what I'm looking at. It's called fracture face. I can't make out any sufficient detail to know what's going on. More up close images of these samples. I'm just gonna go through the rest pretty quickly here. Page 14, page 15, page 16. And last page, page 17. So keep in mind that the metallurgical report, the final version was issued February 19, 2024. The final version, no, I take that back. The, still the draft version of the forensic evaluation report was issued April 5th, 2024. 
in between, there was an independent forensic study published by VN engineers. And this was dated February 26, 2024, where basically they analyzed various aspects of the westbound bridge and pointed out the problems and really left it up to RIDOT if they wanted to replace the bridge or not. They talk about options for repair. They also talk about options for replacement. The report was strongly shaded to suggest that the bridge be replaced, but it wasn't stated definitively and again, left the decision up to RIDOT. This seems to be the time frame from mid-February to the end of February, where I think Rhode Island state government decided to sue all the consultants and contractors with the exception of Cardi for the 10 year period leading up to the discovery of this broken anchor rod. Now this is attorney general, Peter Narona, when what's going on in Rhode Island posted excerpts of the forensic evaluation report. The very next day they posted the full forensic report on their website, but they didn't post the metallurgical report. And those two go hand in hand. And I don't know why they weren't made public long before now, but also I don't know why the Attorney General hasn't released this metallurgical report. So with that, I want to send a shout out to those of you who have contributed to buy me a coffee. That's a great way to support the channel. Of course, I want to thank channel members and those of you who have contributed to Super Thanks, additional great ways to support the channel. So again, I'll keep on this topic and please let me know your comments. Thanks very much, everyone.